Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this special virtual event. We are celebrating today International Women's Day, and it is such an important moment for all of us. It has been over a year since at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So today we take a moment to acknowledge, to honor women and girls' leadership in the United States, Africa, and around the world during this time of pandemic. My name is Lenore Moudou, and I am delighted to welcome you to the African Women for United States a Virtual Summit. And I hope you are as excited as I am to be here for this incredible program. As you know, COVID has revealed how vulnerable we are as a global community. The impact of the virus has exacerbated further the vulnerability and pre-existing inequalities toward women and girls, uh, such as gender-based violence, loss of income, and lack of access to healthcare. However, COVID has emphasized our, our capacity as resilient people, solidarity, and leadership. And these characteristics have been demonstrated by women and girls of African descent for centuries. And now during this pandemic, women are standing tall at the front lines, among other things as health workers and caregivers and make up to 70% of the global workforce. How about that? And at this moment, I'd like us to take a few seconds to give them and all the frontline workers a round of applause, even though we are virtual, we need to thank them for their sacrifice and keeping us safe. So please, just for a few seconds, we want to applause all the health workers. Thank you. Again, we are delighted that you have decided to share your Saturday with us. You'll hear from some extraordinary women leaders, pioneers and trailblazers from around the world, representing governments, businesses, philanthropy, oh. and civil society. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Congresswoman Yvette Diane Clark of the 9th District of New York will be joining us. She's honoring us with her presence. We are also honored to have Ambassador Frédéric Edem Hebe of the Republic of Togo. We thank them both for their time and contribution today. I'd also like to thank the men who are joining us along with Ambassador Hebe today as we celebrate women and girls. Last but not least, we congratulate Aisha Biro Diallo for this fabulous initiative and the entire team as well. Now, it is my pleasure and honor really to introduce our first speaker, a man who does not hesitate to support and stand with women. He is a diplomat, I mentioned him earlier. He is a humanitarian and a proud son of Togo. Ambassador Frédéric Edem Hege has been ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the Republic of Togo to the United States of America since January 2017. Mr. Hebe also exercises jurisdiction over Cuba, Mexico, and Costa Rica. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. We have Ambassador Hebe. I think he's muted. He's talking, but he's muted. He needs oh, to mute okay. himself. Sorry. It's okay now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you for Thank joining. Thank you, madam. Thank you, my sister. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, I'm very pleased to be invited as guest speaker on this virtual summit commemorating the International Women's Day. And I would like to thank the organizers for these events. In Togo, the advancement of women is one of the Togolese president's new mandate priorities. His Excellency for a South United based agenda is to ensure full inclusion of women as we cannot afford to miss out on the contributions of more than half our population and the gender equality in the Togolese society. Togolese women have marked the history of their country for generations. They have also benefited from the advancements of globalization, polarization, 
of human rights and gender concept development. Mechanism, projects, and programs such as establishing a special program branch for the promotion of women created in 1977, protection of young girls in schools or in vocational training centers voted in 1984, and prohibition of all form of female gen genital mutilation FGM adopted in 1998 are laws that advance and emancipate Togolese women. In addition, during the presidential election of February 2020, a provision on maternal health in respect to free cesarean section already 98% subsidized by the states and health needs for pregnant women were announced by the president during his campaign. Also, Togolese women are great entrepreneurs and the marked Togo's history. Women known as Nana Benz imported works, fabrics from Holland and Indonesia which largely impacted the Togolese economy. But change also starts with for the integration of and enhancement of new technology and innovation. The Millennium Challenge Corporation, MCC, Togo, ICT, Information and Communication Technology Projects entered into force in November 2020 with its aims to improve citizens' access to high quality and affordable, reasonably priced ICT, especially among women and small businesses service, a key in advancing learning and networking in businesses. The ambition of the current government is to gradually increase the proportion of women business owners from 22% to 28%. Thus, giving women access to credit from 44.36% up to 60%. In the agricultural sector, women employment from 58.11% percent to 80 percent to increase Togolese women emancipation. Achieving a gender equal world requires innovations. For that, we need more women leaders participating in public life, political and economic arenas, and be part of our and be part of our decision-making system. In the United States, President Joe Biden's administration has Kamala Harris as vice president. And in Togo, we do have a woman as our head of government, Prime Minister, Victoire Tomega Dogbe, and as Defense Minister, Isozimna Marguerite Nyakade, first time women holding these positions in Togo. It's also important to underline that a woman is appointed as Minister Secretary General of the Togolese Presidency, Ablamba Sandra Johnson, totaling 11 women amongst the 33 ministerial portfolio in the Togolese government. Not to mention that the president of our National Assembly, Yawa Chegan, was elected as the first female speaker of the Togolese parliament. Togo has achieved a few minutes progression in women's responsibility and entrepreneurship performance According to the 2021 Bretton Woods Institution, 
I mean, World Bank and the IMF reports initiated by the President of the Republic, His Excellency for Sardinan Yasingbe, Togo's performance in promoting women's leadership has been recognized and saluted by the World Bank. We do all here agree that women's empowerment and gender equality are essential to global progress and that women's rights and participation into society are paramount to unlock the full potential of this sustainable development global SDG. As mentioned by the first female speaker of Togo's National Assembly, Women's Day on March 8, 2021, we are, this, we are to discover the purpose of which we are created. Be examples of daring in, this, in the service of our respective communities, celebrate our beauty and genius, and continue to celebrate life and love as you are the vectors of peace in our disrupted world, says Adam Chega. To end my intervention, and before leaving this exceptional platform due to call of duties, I would like to salute the courage of all women on the front lines in the fight against COVID-19, their resilience and humanitarian service. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Merci, Ambassador Hebe. Thank you. We appreciate your time and sharing with us all the progress made in Togo for women's empowerment and well being. I grew up in Abidjan hearing about Mama Ben. So, yes, they are fearless and very, very powerful. But thank you again for, for your words. So we appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Now, I am delighted to invite the woman with the vision, the relentless Aisha Biro Diallo. Aisha wears many hats, among other things. She is a business and financial policy analyst, gender and political activist, as well as founder and CEO of Pan African Movement for Democratic Women. She currently co chairs Virginia and Washington, D.C., Women for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris 2020, Deputy Progress Director for Miss African Union Pageant and program director for Believe in Africa. That's just a few of what she does. Aisha will introduce our keynote speaker today. Aisha, welcome and take it away. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone for accepting our invitation and uh, joining us on this Saturday morning. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, like I said, I'm going to start introducing our keynote speakers. She is the proud daughter of Jamaican immigrant and take her passion for her Caribbean heritage to Congress. She is chair of the Homeland uh, Cybersecurity, Infrastructure, Protection and Innovation Subcommittees under the jurisdiction of the House of Committee of Homeland Security. She is a leader in the tech and media policy space as co-chair of the Smart City Caucus and co-chair of the Multicultural Media Caucus. She has been a member of the Congress Black Caucus since 2007 and today chair its Immigration Tax Force. She, she proudly represents the 9th Congressional District of New York. She is a graduate of Oberlin College and was recipient of the prestigious APAM Sloan Fellowship in Public Policy and Policy Analysis. She received the honorary degree of Doctor of Law Honoris Causa from the University of Technology, Jamaica, Jamaica and the honorary Doctor of Public Policy from the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. She is a personal hero of mine. I am honored to have the privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark, Vice Chair, House of Committee on Energy and Commerce. Congresswoman 
Yvette, you are welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your wonderful introduction, Aisha, to the very distinguished panelists, His Excellencies, Her Excellencies gathered here, my colleagues in government, uh, and to everyone who is viewing us today, a pleasant good afternoon to each and every one. It is such a pleasure to be before you today. As has been stated, I am Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark, and I proudly represent New York's 9th Congressional District that is in Brooklyn, New York, Central and South Brooklyn. Let me first say happy International Women's Day and Women's History Month to all of the ladies and allies of the ladies who are gathered before us today. This panel has been convened to celebrate women's contributions during the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's get to celebrating. Help is here in the United States of America. The Biden-Harris administration has signed a historic piece of legislation into law, the American Rescue Plan. This week is one of great progress and great promise. We are ensuring that as we promised, help has arrived to the American people. The COVID-19 pandemic and economic crisis have destroyed lives and livelihoods across our nation. Tens of millions of Americans have been infected and more than half a million lives have been lost to this deadly and lethal virus. Meanwhile, the economic crisis is accelerating. More than 20 million Americans are receiving unemployment benefits. Nearly 24 million are going hungry with an estimated 12 million children living in households with food insecurity and up to 40 million cannot afford to pay rent and fear eviction. And our most vulnerable communities are bearing the brunt of these twin crises. Over 2.3 million women have been forced to leave the workforce entirely, including nearly 1 million mothers and eight of 10 businesses owned by our nation's Black, Latinx, and Asian American entrepreneurs are on the brink of closure. The passage of the American Rescue Plan is the most comprehensive transformative legislation that we have seen arguably since Social Security and Medicaid was passed in this nation. We have support included in this legislation for historic aid to Black farmers. And economists agree that these steps taken together will generate $1.25 for every dollar of spending and cut child poverty in half and lift nearly 12 million people out of poverty. Overall, poverty will be cut by a third with the poverty rates of Black Americans falling by 42%, rates for Latinx families falling by 39%. The, I, the women's his, this Women's History Month, I have been dedicated to highlighting the contributions of women, particularly women of African descent to our modern society. We have been at the helm of every significant discovery, advanced innovation in ways that are unparalleled and sustained excellence despite gender-based oppression, chauvinism, racism, xenophobia, and other harmful ideologies focused on impeding a woman's right to advance. To that end, I want to take a moment to highlight a woman that brings me great pride, a woman of Caribbean descent, occupying the second highest seat in our land, Vice President Kamala Harris. I have worked with Vice President Harris, then Senator Harris, to introduce legislation to support women increase diversity, can combat health crises, plaguing Black women, and find solutions to racial and economic inequalities. 
I salute my sister, Madam Vice President. While she's not a, a member of my sorority, I can proudly say that a, as a member of what we consider to be Divine Nine sororities, it is a pleasure to see her in the White House. I take great pride in celebrating dynamic women and all we accomplish in our diligence. With our collective work representing for Black women and girls throughout this nation and around the world, I am excited about what the future brings in a post-COVID uh, era. And let me say too, that when we talk about women, and we talk about the challenges that they're facing economically, the implications are global in their reach. We know that so many who have immigrated to the United States have served as a lifeline to the villages, the cities, the places that they left to come to the United States. And through their remittances, through their philanthropy and charity, have undergirded the economies, the GDP of many of the nations from whence we pale. So as we look at International Women's Month, let us not forget that we have been economic powerhouses at, alongside the men of our family to bring a benefit to not only our adopted homeland, but the the nations from whence we fail. I currently serve as co-chair of a caucus in the House of Representatives called the Black Women and Girls Congressional Caucus. I can truly say Vice President Harris is a realization of hope that many of our predecessors thought they would never see. I genuinely look forward to the trailblazing advancements that she will accomplish. Another trailblazer I want to mention during this difficult season is my dear friend and colleague, a Congresswoman from Dallas, Texas. Her name is Eddie Bernice Johnson, and she serves as chairwoman of the Committee on Science, Space, and Te Technology in the House of Representatives. I could not imagine a more fitting time to honor a woman who has dedicated her career towards our cause. Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson was elected as the first African-American member, uh, the first African-American woman from the state of Texas to serve in the House of Representatives. And she is the first African-American to serve as both ranking member and now chairwoman of the prestigious Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Since 2019, she has served as chairwoman of the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, and has long indicated that the need to involve women of color in the STEM field is something that we cannot afford to take for granted. I imagine she won't stop until a single woman of color is not denied the means to unlock their scientific potential. And that is why I recently introduced a resolution in the House of Representatives designating March 2021 as the Eddie Bernice Johnson Black Women in Science and Technology Month. Overcoming the disparities Black women face in STEM disciplines is not an overnight process, but will only succeed if no step is skipped getting there. The one observation that I'd like to share with you in this regard is that I have witnessed the growth of women, particularly those who have come to our nation from continental Africa, excelling in the sciences. In every single discipline. And you are, these women are what I call the hidden figures. It is our obligation and responsibility to lift these women up in the public square so that all children, all children of color will know that 
their brain power is a great equalizer and that they can accomplish anything when you look at the numbers of women who have advanced beyond all recognition. That includes also recognizing the incredible and invaluable achievements that these women have made. It includes, again, lifting champions of the STEM disciplines, like my dear friend and colleague, Congresswoman Johnson, and of course, the numbers of doctors, the numbers of lawyers and scientists who are involved in leading us through this pandemic. Designating a path for the future of women and, and, and women of color as scientists, technologists, mathematicians who will secure the future of our communities, not only here in the United States, but on the global stage. Because we know in this context, the United States of America, representation matters. And from where we sit, we know that our example is mirrored around the world. I vow to continue uplifting this critical work, not only here in my district in Washington, DC, but on the global stage where we represent the beautiful diaspora that is African. As a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and the co-chair of the Congressional Caucus on Smart Cities, Multicultural Media, and Black Women and Girls, I will stand tall. 1993 Nobel Laureate Toni Morrison said, definitions belong to the definer, not the defined. We must define ourselves. Ladies, I'm here to tell you our future looks bright. We are cultivating greatness and that knows no bounds. This, ladies, this global pandemic has hit us in ways we previously could not even fathom. However, we are still here. We honor the lives we've lost and look forward to forging ahead to create a more equitable future for all of us. So I encourage everyone to stay strong, stay healthy, stay safe, stay blessed. And until you receive your vaccine, and even after, continue to wear your mask. As they say in Jamaica, one love, walk good. Thank you. One love indeed. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark, for these passionate remarks. And we'll make sure we keep wearing our masks. Women like you embody the leadership, boldness, and dedication that many other women and girls aspire to. And you are a true inspiration. And we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Now it is time for our panel discussions. And I'd like to invite our first convener, a woman I'm proud to call a friend and a sister. Dr. Leila Ndiaye is an advisor on trade and investment in West Africa. Uh, she was previously the senior director of policy for African affairs at the US Chamber of Commerce and also served in the government of Cote d'Ivoire as special advisor to the head of state. Leila, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Linor Moudou, we, I go by Rachel because uh, I would like to, to let the audience know that Rachel and I, uh, our friendship dates since high school, uh, <laughs> back in Cote d'Ivoire where I'm uh, originally from. I'm very proud of you. And uh, since you're the host, nobody introduced you. And I decided to actually share your profile with the audience uh, because you're a true ins inspiration for, for African women. Uh, so Rachel is a journalist and television personality uh, with uh, almost 20 years of uh, experience. And she currently works at the TV and radio, uh, as a TV and a radio anchor at uh, VOA uh, in Washington, DC. So now I am honored and uh, really uh, uh, 
proud to introduce the first panel. The first panel that will be moderated by uh, Ambassador Omar Aruna. Mr. Aruna is the former ambassador of the Republic of Benin to the United States, Mexico, and the former representative of the country to the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and uh, at, 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 uh, here in Washington. Ambassador Aruna is currently the managing partner of US Africa Cyber Security Group, a cybersecurity management consultancy and, consultancy, and the CEO of Global Specialty LLC, a global business development services to organizations and their business community uh, seeking market entry and establishing business operations in Africa. We also have on the panel uh, representative uh, Ala Ayala, a lifelong Virginian delegate Ala Ayala was elected to the House of Delegates in 2017 and currently represents the 50, 51st district, which covers part of Prince William County. Ala is the daughter of a Salvadorian and North American immigrant father and an Irish and Lebanese mother. She has worked as a cybersecurity specialist for over 20 years with the Department of Homeland Security to protect our nation's information system, systems. Hala has also been a women's activist, a uh, women rights activist for over a decade. As a delegate, Allah has worked to pass some of Virginia's most important pieces of legislation, like expanding Medicaid for 400,000 Virginians, raising teacher pay, passing the Equal Rights Amendment, and expanding background checks to keep guns out of dangerous hands. Allah is running for Lieutenant Governor because she understands our Commonwealth, its history, its challenges, its many opportunities, and wants to ensure every Virginian has the opportunity to succeed. We also have on the panel, uh, Representative Naketa Ricks from Colorado. Representative Ricks is the Colorado State Representative for House District 40, and the first Liberian American to be elected to a US State Assembly. She is the co-founder and president of the African Chamber of Commerce of Colorado, USA, and the founder of the African Economic Development Center. She has been recognized by, by the Colorado Black Roundtable, the Historic National Council of Negro Women, and the Colorado Black Educators Association, receiving various accolades, including the Salute Award. She is currently working on hosting several pop-up COVID-19 vaccine clinics for the African immigrant community and other communities of color in order to ensure that the vaccine is distributed equ equitably. Then we have on the panel another distinguished panelist, uh, Mrs. E.J. Scott. Mrs. E.J. Scott has been involved with environmental policy and political activism for almost, I mean, for most of her life. Scott says uh, she uses her scientific background in daily job as an environmental and emergency management program manager to evaluate and uh, mitigate. Scott is a member of the 10th Congressional District Committee and has, a and has been a delegate uh, to the last three Democratic National Conventions. Scott serves as the Virginia Green Director to the convention and worked to reduce the convention delegates carbon footprint, uh, footprint in 2008 and 2012. This year, she was elected as the, I mean, it was last year, she was elected as the 2020 United States Presidential Elector for the Commonwealth of Virginia from the 10th Congressional District. She currently chairs the Democratic Black Caucus of Virginia. Then we have on the panel, Dorinda White. She is a public affairs, strategic communications, executive communications, speech writer, professional with healthcare communications expertise and social media strategies. Uh, she uh, has also worked on Capitol Hill and uh, her portfolio included women's issues, space and technology, judiciary, 
uh, Africa entertainment industry healthcare. And uh, we have joining us, and it is also uh, my pleasure and distinguished honor to introduce to you uh, someone that uh, you know uh, by seeing her work uh, during the crisis, a trailblazer, Dr. Sylvie de Souza, who is the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Brooklyn Hospital since October 2015. She is a daughter of a career uh, diplomat from Benin, where she spent her early childhood uh, years and the daughter also of a French mother uh, who was a teacher. As a result of her upbringing, Dr. de Souza developed a capacity to adapt to any situation with ease and a unique ability to connect with people from all cultures and background. Her commitments are anchored in public service, teaching and training emergency physicians of the future in the delivery of compassionate patient-centered care. Now, I am pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Ambassador Aruna. The floor is yours. It's virtual, but it's the virtual floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leila. And uh, thank, uh, uh, really thank you, my distinguished uh, panelists. You know, on March 1st, 2020, everything changed. Life as we know it was unpended. And over the past 12 months, we faced unexpected and unrelenting challenges. And through it all, story of heartache, arrows, and hope emerge. According to Dr. Natalia Kanem, the executive director of the UNFPA, throughout the COVID-19 crisis, women have kept entire societies going, sustaining health system as the majority of frontline workers and courageously managing extra responsibility at home in caring for the ill, as well as children out of school. They have kept open shelters for survivors of violence against women. And they have scaled mountain literally to distribute contraceptive. In short, women themselves have offered vivid and forgettable testament to the value of their leadership. So, to all my panelists, as a woman leader at the forefront and in the limelight, how did you manage this past year? We can start with uh, Delegate Ayala. Hi, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending where you're joining us from. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for having me. And I uh, broke up on my end. So you asked me, a were you asking a question or just asking us to introduce ourselves? I'm happy to do both. Well, you can introduce yourself, but the question I ask is, as a woman leader at the forefront and in the limelight, mm -hmm. how did you manage this past year? So, Ambassador, thank you for your question. Um, as you know, I'm Delegate Hala Ayala. We made history in Virginia electing women of color and diversity to the General Assembly for the first time in its 400, well, I want to say 400 year body, but uh, for, for a very long time. And we worked very hard to elect our first um, African American woman leader and our first woman speaker. And that was within the 401 years of our body. I am a, a national security specialist by trade and have done work in cybersecurity. That's my scope for nearly 22 years. And, um, you know, I was one of the lucky ones, you know, over this last year to really talk or look at the pandemic and was able to work from home. Um, the legislature, although uh, not supposed to be a full time uh, operation, it is. We do work around the clock helping our constituents. Um, COVID has exacerbated uh, Virginians here in the Commonwealth, especially Black and Brown Virginians. This is including equity, food security, and our education system. Um, I like to talk about how I managed, but I'd rather talk about our community and our constituency and, the, and every Virginian. And Virginians were worried about how they were going to put food on the table or how they were going to keep roof over their head. And you know, elected officials across the Commonwealth, including myself, answered numerous calls about unemployment, about the uncertainty of what 
this pandemic was. Um, you know, watching Trump manage this pandemic uh, really hurt us in a lot of ways when we're talking about access to PPEs or um, just the, you know, science itself and how it was or was not reliable. Um, managing this as an elected official and as a single mother, um, it was a it's, it was definitely a balancing act. But Ambassador, I'll tell you, for every woman, especially communities of color in this Commonwealth, they were far more impacted. And um, as the good Congresswoman said before she left, help is on the way with the election of Joe Biden. Um, and I know we're going to dig into more, but I will tell you this: there's more that we have to do. We've done a lot here in the Commonwealth, and um, I'm so glad that I am able to help my constituency and uh, any member of the Commonwealth as we navigate this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Ayala. But before you leave the floor, you have a Salvadorian and North African immigrant father, an Irish and Lebanese mother. Correct. And you also reported that COVID-19 was exacerbated existing inequities and has devastated Virginia mm -hmm. women. I right. would really be interested in hearing your view on how differently those minority, where you from, and the, those group of men are handling the pandemic. I know you brush of it quickly, mm -hmm. but specifically in the Salvadorian, the North African communities, uh, how are they managing the pandemic? Well, I can't speak for every adult in the Commonwealth or child in the Commonwealth. Um, I will tell you this, we've noticed that, you know, after losing income, just being on the front lines, Black and Latino families have been on the front lines of this pandemic. They have either been frontline workers, healthcare workers, and just been at the forefront of this fight since day one. Um, it exacerbated its the COVID in, exacerbated inequities because schools were shut down. You know, we had no in, in, insight or information to how we were going to combat this virus. Healthcare accessibility. When you're talking about, yes, we've done so much work with expanding Medicaid here in the Commonwealth to 400,000 Virginians, but there were so many more Virginians who did not have access to affordable healthcare. So if their lives were impacted by COVID, they could have not only suffered job loss, but lack of access to healthcare to help them overcome this, this virus, this deadly virus. And we saw just play out over the media how children of color were disproportionately impacted, mm -hmm. how if you've lost your job and you didn't happen, thank God, have the virus or have been you know, contacted it, but you've lost your job, you could have also lost your home. These inequities that already have existed over the 401 years of this eldest body of our legislature, but our country for black and brown communities have in, exacerbated the inequities, whether it was, it was access to food, access to affordable housing, whether it was access to affordable health care. And it is a large conversation. And I think one of the things that we try to do in the General Assembly is address these very issues. So for instance, um, a lot of pieces of legislation I carried to prevent garnishment of relief checks by creditors. So when the first round of the stimulus came to each one of our families, um, or a lot of the families in our Commonwealth, my legislation said, you can't come in and garnish these checks and, yes. and take this away. We're hurting right now. And we have just needed to make sure that every family had an opportunity to provide for their own. Um, we are looking for the second round of stimulus checks, but there we see the disparities there. Um, we could have had pay, um, access to paid family medical leave. We could have had access to raising the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Here in the Commonwealth, we've raised the minimum wage, but those inequities of uh, that pay gap still exist. So if I can, Ambassador, I'll take a few steps back. A year ago, we passed the Equal Rights Amendment and two women, um, and including Senator McClellan, who's joining us now in the Senate, championed this piece of legislation because we wanted to talk about the inequities. Just if we're talking about economics, uh, women of color, Latinas mm -hmm. made 58 cents on the dollar here in America. 
um, black women made 68 cents on the dollar, white women made 78 cents on the dollar in comparison to our white, white counterparts. This on top of you know, not having the Equal Rights Amendment because it takes 38 states to ratify our constitution. We did that. So on the floor, 100 years later, we did not enshrine until 2020 basic equality, regardless of sex, into our constitution. So it seems like you guys have been extremely busy uh, yeah. in Virginia. <laughs> Well, okay. we know the, the systemic inequities in our systems, right? Whether it be for individuals of color or women of color in the United States. We've seen this play out on every platform, but we've been busy. We've been passing to address the inequities, not only economic, but also racial inequities in our government. And we're going to continue to fight. Good. I can talk Good. about this all day, and I know you need to move on. I know. I need to we're gonna fight, Ambassador. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Delegate Ayala. And uh, I would like to talk to, uh, 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 ask Dr. D'Souza. You know, Dr. D'Souza, you are the Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Brooklyn Hospital Center. New York City was an epicenter of coronavirus and you were at the heart of it. When did you realize, Dr. D'Souza, that it was time for you to pull out your superwoman cape? So first, you know, I'd like to thank the, the moderators and organizers. I'm honored to have been asked to participate in this event um, in the presence of such an amazing group of leaders. Um, so when did I have to realize I had to pull out my superwoman cape? Um, as an emergency physician um, and leading a team at the Brooklyn Hospital where Dr. Fauci happened to be born. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know that little um, trivia, um, we're, uh, we've lived through many disasters over the years, 9-11, derailments, um, disasters, um, the H1N1 crisis, to just to name a few. And as emergency physicians, we're constantly surveilling what is occurring in the United States and in other places in the world, as we know that any remote event can eventually directly or indirectly impact us. We're trained for what we call emergency preparedness, the ability to react to any disaster, catastrophes, natural or man-made, and to respond quickly in an organized manner. As we watched what was happening in China, we were appropriately concerned. When the first case um, uh, appeared in New York as reported by the New York Times on March 1st, 2020, we went to work immediately, too worried to wait for any sort of guidance from governmental agencies. We knew exactly what we had to do. This is what we're trained for. We knew that soon enough, we would have to manage not only illness, but the fear that would gain the public. Two days later on March 3rd, we were ready or so we thought. It wasn't long before we realized that what was coming was of a magnitude that we had never seen before. The wave of devastation came like a tsunami. Soon we were at the epicenter of the pandemic, as you stated, treating a disease we knew so little about. Each day we had to adapt, rethink our approaches and treatments to stay ahead of the virus and save as many lives as we could. We were soon overwhelmed though by the sheer volume of patients the severity of the disease, the repeated and unbearable loss of life on a scale we had never encountered in our entire careers. Unlike other disasters where casualties arrived to us from the field, this time around, we were the ones standing in the field, immersed in the danger zone, right there amongst the victims we were trying to save. Many came to help, but everyone knew as we did that the one standing in the burning building was us. Of course, we were scared. We went to work with the fear of being the next victim or worse, taking that disease, deadly disease home to our families and loved ones. But everyone without hesitation answered the call. This is what we do. This is what we signed up for. This is our calling. My role and responsibility as the leader of an emergency medical team was to preserve 
as many lives as possible to provide care, comfort and guidance to all comers, including those with little or no access to health care, disproportionately affected by the disease. One of the toughest challenge, I must say, was to manage fear and unbearable grief while keeping the team encouraged every day and ensuring everyone's safety. Even though they had been placed in my charge, I quickly saw the need to empower each member of the team to make quick decisions when necessary. And what I saw was nothing short of extraordinary. When all hands on deck were suddenly needed, every team member put on their own cape, not just me. And they too became leaders right from where they stood. Thank you, uh, Dr. D'Souza. I hope that you're planning to excel anytime soon. Uh, to continue our panel, I would like to really engage uh, Representative Ritz. Often, Representative Ritz, often officials refer to the fight against the coronavirus as war. Having fled a civil war in Liberia as a young girl, what say you? As a representative of District 40 in the Colorado House of Representatives and a leader in your community, you champion pop-up coronavirus vaccine clinic aimed to get Aurora's immigrant community immunized. Can you explain why that's so important to you? Thank you so much. I just want to thank our host, um, your excellencies, and all the distinguished guests that are here today. Yes, um, as a representative in Colorado, it was very important for me to get involved, but I, I want to kind of go a step back. So last year, uh, right about this time, which is about the anniversary of when COVID struck, we, I was in the middle of my campaign, um, campaigning in a very complex environment to become a representative here in my, in, in my district in, in Colorado. COVID threw us a whole loop because we could not knock on doors anymore. We had to become very, very innovative in the approach to the voters. Uh, people did not want to see people coming to the door. So we had to use a lot of social media and engagements, come up with messaging that resonated with people about getting Colorado back to work, helping our small businesses so that they would be able to weather the storm coming from COVID. A lot of small businesses were unable to get the PPP loans or the economic uh, uh, disaster loans that were put out by the government during the first round from the SBA. So as the head of the African Chamber of Commerce, we had to come out and start to tell people about how to access these resources. So I was doing that in the midst of my campaign. We did a series of Zoom meetings on a weekly basis, which really engaged community to help to get them information, to kind of ease a lot of the anxiety. There was food insecurity that we were dealing with. We had people worrying about work because everything was shut down here in Colorado and, and of course across the country. But then I ultimately got elected after a very tough election. Okay, my, um, my opponent had all of the support from the leadership within the party. He had all the endorsements from the unions. He had over $160,000 that was spent on his behalf in, in the election cycle, uh, in the primary. And we were working with $15,000. So it was like truly a David and Goliath race. But we prevailed uh, by the grace of God in a lot of hard work. Um, so once I got elected uh, in November, we started working on bills. But we quickly realized that more white uh, uh, residents in our community were accessing the vaccines. There seemed to be vaccine hesitancy. But along with that, I think just not understanding how to access these uh, vaccines, especially in the immigrant and refugee community. The governor then gave us the op opportunity to promote the vaccine and to ensure equity. And so it was very important for me to get something done for the immigrant and refugee community here within Colorado, which is a very underserved uh, community. So I partnered with a local church, which is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and was able to do our first vaccine clinic on February 13th. It was one of the coldest days in Colorado. 
And I mean, people showed up. We had, we started out thinking that we would vaccine, vaccinate only about a hundred people. It went from a hundred people to 200. Ultimately, we ended up with 300 people on that day. Everyone showed up, even though it was below, very, very cold in Colorado. People showed up to get that vaccine. The community was so responsive. They felt like they had hit the jackpot. It was like, oh, thank you so much for bringing it to us. And it's important when you talk about equity that you position and bring resources into the communities that you're targeting because people, because of language barriers, cultural barriers, maybe transportation issues, whatever the issue might be, they won't know how to access it. So uh, that was the first vaccine clinic. Then we, we recently did another one, I partnered with Senator Buckner from my, my district, and we did something uh, last Saturday. So I think that this whole equity position and ensuring that all of the communities are receiving this life-saving vaccine is so important. And I'm very thankful that, you know, working with the Colorado Department of uh, Public Health, we were able to do that. And I, I plan to continue to do that because there's more requests coming in. And I'm so excited that there's more access to vaccines because the Biden administration is really working to make these vaccines available. So thank you. So, uh, Representative Hicks, you are on a war path then. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's great. We, we, we're fighting this good fight, but it's a, it's a really good fight to fight. So. Oh, 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 okay. Uh, we have another distinguished panelist uh, that I would like to engage on the subject. Uh, and uh, is Dorinda White. Well, I call her Randy because uh, she's the president of the DC Federation of Democratic Women in Washington, DC. Obviously, it's clear that black men effectively made a great difference during this election. In your role as a leader, women leader, during that electoral process within the Democratic Party, why do you think that it is? What do you think that the provision, the previous administration response to COVID-19 have been a determining factor? Do you think the previous administration response to, uh, to COVID have been a determining factor in engaging more women to elect uh, the current uh, president? Uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, Aruna uh, Omar for uh, number one, for having me here today. And first of all, I'd like to say um, happy International Women's Day and Women's History Month. So. Yes, as the president of the DC Federation of Democratic Women, and just to let you know, we are one federation in about 35 state federations around the country. We had to pivot very, very quickly um, all of last year to make certain that despite COVID-19, we were able to not only engage women as widely as possible and in a different environment, but also to make certain that they engaged other members of their communities and their families while still staying safe. Um, uh, what you don't know is I'm also the public affairs officer for the District of Columbia State Medicaid Agency, which means um, I had a dual role, not only with from political standpoint, um, keeping my women members engaged and helping to get um, my sorority sister, Kamala Harris, elected as vice president and uh, the president of the United States, uh, Joe Biden. But um, I had to also uh, do a dual role by also making certain that we pivoted as the state Medicaid agency to serve our 270,000 Medicaid beneficiaries, who many of them had chronic, uh, multiple chronic uh, conditions that would make them uh, prime candidates to be COVID uh, victims. So as a woman leader here in DC, we, our group, the DC Federation Democratic Women, we worked um, immediately to engage both locally and nationally. We worked in the battleground states using Zoom, uh, phone calls, postcards, texting, everything that we could use to reach out to our various communities in those states to make certain that we engaged them and we gave them the impetus to move forward to make a difference, which they did. Um, I can say personally that um, despite COVID, I was able to go to both Philadelphia and to Georgia to assist in ballot curing to make certain that the ballots that were cast by voters were um, valid. And if they weren't, to make certain that the, if any corrections could be made because of mishaps on behalf of the voter, that they could be made legally and in the in the in, in record time. 
from the COVID-19 standpoint, um, I was activated on actually exactly one year ago as part of Mayor Bowser's uh, COVID-19 Emergency Response Team Joint Information Command. It's a short uh, uh, term, a long term for saying that we were the public information officers from the District of Columbia who were disseminating the information to our over 700,000 district residents to keep them informed about COVID, to let them know about programs, and to let them know just to keep them from having an overall general fear of what was happening. Um, I can say that from a political standpoint, um, even here locally, the women, uh, especially the politically active women, we hunkered down. We knew what we had to do and we knew we had to make things happen no matter what. So we immediately uh, sprung into action and created, um, for my group, we created the Team 2020, for example. And our mission was to make certain that here locally and in the battleground states, we could stretch out our arms and our contacts and our information sources so that we could inspire women, not only to inspire their families and their communities, but to make certain that they were involved at the state and local levels in whatever um, election um, activities were going to be going on in their state. So COVID-19 uh, during the Trump administration did put a hamper initially on our efforts because everyone focused on staying within their bubble, staying safe, staying uh, close to each other, but still we were, we had access to information. Not only did the COVID hamper our efforts, um, I live right here in Southwest Washington, DC. So I'm right between the White House and the Capitol. So I had the unfortunate <laughs> experience of having to also um, hear and see uh, the Black Lives Matters marches come right under my window or to hear the, the flash bombs that were, that were being thrown during the protest and to be blocked when I wanted to go just shopping because I was right near the Capitol and the, the, the soldiers had blocked off everything. So the Trump administration's efforts and the COVID-19 pandemic combined were, yes, they hampered our efforts, but they didn't stop us. Um, we um, oftentimes, I would say, when I was speaking to my members of my organization, we need to pre prepare for war in a time of peace. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we prepared to, to basically circumvent all of the obstacles that were going to be presented to us as, mm -hmm. uh, for example, here in D.C., we did a Zoom meeting on what's on the D.C. ballot, what you need to know, because many people were confused. They knew they could mail them in. They didn't know how to fill them out they knew that post offices around the country and also here locally were being circumvented by the Trump administration. So we worked hard to identify the issues and to provide immediate solutions so we could get around them. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Randy. Uh, I think Ms. E.G. Scott also is the chair of the Democratic Black Office of Virginia. Did you guys use in Virginia the same playbook that uh, uh, your uh, ladies uh, in D.C. use? Ms. E.G., I think that's All good. right, so, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I believe I'm unmuted now. Uh, yeah. I just wanna say uh, thank you. Uh, I am so honored to be a part of this uh, panel. And as uh, they were being introduced, I was wondering how did I get into this distinguished panel? And then uh, I heard um, my connection. Um, a few years ago, I did my, uh, DNA. And I found out that the preponderance of my DNA came from a small country uh, called Benin. And oh, you see, <laughs> it's all in the family then. <laughs> and the only thing I knew about Benin at that time was that it had been one of the countries where the reclamation statue was put, you know, the three countries um, that it was put in. So I was just eager to find out more. So in 2018, I got on a plane right after Christmas and went over and spent uh, uh, about 10 days there. I was so much in love and enjoyed the place. This last year, 2019, the day after Christmas, I got on a plane and went and I was staying for uh, quite a while. Wow. Uh, I got back here just in time when COVID-19 hit. And so I'm wearing my bracelets right now that my family in uh, Benin 
uh, made for me, and I was given the, the name Tassino uh, Liesice. So um, thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm happy to share that story with everyone. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, Virginia uh, has been working hard. We have been working hard to, to get uh, a lot of laws passed that would help the common people. But we also worked hard to make sure that our voters went out as well. As chair of the Democratic Black Caucus, uh, I saw, felt it was important for all of us uh, states to work together in order to get out the black vote. So I reached out to my counterpart in Washington, DC, who was head of the Black Caucus there, Tony Dungy. I uh, also reached out to our Maryland counterpart, um, Thea uh, Boykin, and we all uh, talked together about what we could do in order to ensure that uh, black people in our areas uh, were able to vote and vote safely and and uh, get um, and get to the ballot without uh, uh, any encumbrance. So um, I came up with this program called We Vote Safe, and it was implemented. Uh, all across uh, uh, the area. The We Vote Safe program, we partnered with a number of groups and churches in order to ensure that the message get out. We actually did training uh, of how, uh, when you, how to uh, apply for your absentee uh, ballot, taught you how, when you got the ballot, what was inside it, and how to actually complete the ballot. We went through a number of, of iterations and did the presentation to um, several church groups, um, organizations, fraternities, sororities, just to make sure that people who had been used to standing in line and voting didn't have to do that and could actually get their vote heard and be safe doing it. So that was a, a very big push for us. And, and we here uh, in Virginia, we don't give up very easily. We really work hard. We worked hard for years in order to get a majority uh, Democratic House and Democratic Senate. And we have all of the uh, executive offices here in Virginia. And that took a lot of time and a lot of work. And we continue to do that work. So are you saying that Virginia is not only for lovers, it's also for fighters? It's absolutely for fighters. I always tell people, you know, that um, uh, I always uh, uh, don't mind fighting because I know that the other side is fighting to keep me down. So when I get up, I'm fighting back. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, as we come in close to the end of this panel, I, I would like uh, that, uh, uh, that everyone on this panel feel free to engage. But I wanted to ask a question at the beginning of the panel. The question was, as a woman leader at the forefront in the limelight, how did you manage this past year? I heard everything but yourself. You talk about how you help other people. You talk about how you help the community. But I'm interested about knowing how did you manage yourself? Because at the end of the day, if you're helping us, we want to make sure that you remain there to keep on helping us. So while we're getting close to this panel, closing this panel, I will start briefly, and we have to be very brief, with going back again to the person who was in the eye of the storm. I will ask her directly, are you planning to exhale anytime soon, Dr. D'Souza? I hope so. <laughs> I certainly hope so. I think that um, with the vaccine here and uh, all the uh, the hope on the horizon, it's uh, time to at least you know um, think of exhaling, not completely exhale yet. But I think what kept me um, encouraged uh, was really um, prayer and uh, my faith. Uh, my family yeah, um, definitely kept me encouraged and uh, um, I had to find it within myself to keep others encouraged. So um, I think um, I didn't really have time to think about myself and it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad you pointed this out because a lot of us in the front lines 
are now feeling the after effects of all the efforts we've um, put forward in the last few months. So thank you for bringing this important issue, but it's certainly one that needs to be addressed. The mental health of healthcare workers has taken a big hit. Thank you. Delegate Ayala, what do you say? Maybe Deltek Ayala is not still with, is she still with us? But we'll go to Representative Rix then, if she's still around. Is she planning to excel anytime soon? Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I would say that I prayed a lot. It was just the grace of God and faith, um, just knowing that there was a fight worth fighting and there was something bigger than myself that I needed to um, achieve during this time. And I think we're still fighting to, to come out of it where we can see some light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not there yet. So until we can get people safe, get people back to work, um, you know, I continue to pray and I continue to work because <laughs> faith without work is dead. So we have to keep pushing. How about uh, the president of the, uh, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, Dorinda. Are you planning to excel? Well, certainly I'm planning to exhale. This has been a, a very, um, as everyone uses the same word, unprecedented year. And uh, luckily for us here in the District of Columbia, the mayor uh, allowed us as of March 16th of uh, last year, 16th, to work from home. So I've been working from home. And uh, at a distance, I've been monitoring and providing feedback and input and getting feedback and input. I'd have to say the collective group of women that I've worked with and that I deal with on a daily basis with my federation, both here locally and around the country has been a focus point for me in terms of breathing, just breathing, but to exhale, I cannot wait to travel again. Right before the pandemic, I had done uh, the, the Blue Note at the Sea Jazz Cruise, and I came back, went to the, the NFL football game in Florida, and I came back, and then the pandemic started. So my exhaling will be when I can get on a plane with my mask on and practicing all social distancing protocol, and I can either go back to my second home in Italy, where I lived for 10 years, and they're waiting for me, but I know they just went on lockdown again for Pasqua, for, um, Pasqua, for, for Easter. Um, or if I can get on a cruise and go somewhere, that is when I will exhale. That's great. Uh, and uh, Mrs. E.G. Scott, what are you thinking of? Okay, well, first of all, let me say it's Miss E.J. Scott. I don't want anyone to think I'm married just in case anybody has brothers or something they'd like to introduce <laughs> me to. So, Same here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay, but, uh, I stand corrected then. Miss E.J. Scott. Thank you. You know, I uh, uh, here in Virginia, uh, we have... Uh, uh, every year elections. I mean, every single year. So we don't get a lot of time to exhale or to uh, like, that's why my general trips come right after Christmas and at the beginning of the year, um, because up and after that until November, we're working on a, uh, something to do with elections. Right now we're in a primary season and we've got a lot of people running for governor, lieutenant governor, uh, and plus we have all uh, 100 of members of our House of Delegates are up uh, for re-election or to fill uh, those seats. So we don't get a lot of time, but I do take my uh, time. As I said, I, I love to travel. I've uh, been around uh, all over and I, I'm just um, uh, gonna keep on doing what I do because helping people helps me. I don't know uh, wh what other people feel, but. Uh, when I'm giving uh, that support to someone, uh, it makes me feel better. And so I enjoy that. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope I did not forget anyone on the panel. If I do, uh, uh, I would like for them to uh, say the piece right now. Otherwise, uh, we will uh, so kindly close this uh, first panel, but we ask you to keep on the, uh, stay on the, uh, on the platform keep engaged and uh, I would like to uh, welcome back our host uh, so she can take it and uh, move to the second panel. 
Thank you, ladies. Uh, really, it was humbling being with you and listening to your experience. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, we really deserve your help. And uh, if we if we did not, uh, we will make sure that uh, we make uh, we, uh, we make a better uh, uh, we do better going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Omar Aruna, for moderating such a great discussion, really. And uh, many thanks to our esteemed panelists for your time, your valuable insights, and uh, also sharing your experience. Uh, what an amazing group of leaders, really. There was so much takeaways from this panel, but uh, we are now going to move to the next panel discussion. And it is my pleasure to invite to the virtual floor, our next convener, Sylvia Litana Robertson. Ms. Robertson is a director for ADDI chapter formations, as well as senior advisor for special initiatives to the founder and president of African Diaspora Development Institute, Her Excellency Dr. Arikana Chiambore Pau. Take it away, Sylvia. Thank you so much, uh, Leonard. It's a pleasure always coming online and uh, working with you. Your bubbliness always gives me life when I see your beautiful face. Thank you so very much. Uh, like every, like the first panelist said, thank you very much. That was a, a tremendous, tremendous amount of information that we're all learning, you know, during this COVID-19. And a lot of us have learned things that we didn't know, especially myself when I listened to these uh, powerful women on uh, the first panel. So going forward, we're also continuing with women leadership uh, during this COVID-19. And on my panel, I have the following distinguished guests. It is my pleasure to introduce Senator Jennifer McClellan, from District 9, Ambassador Jocelyn Clark Fletcher, Dr. Rugi Baldy, I hope I didn't butcher the name, <laughs> Reverend Adawa, and uh, Ms. Denise uh, O'Brien, as well as Her Excellency Ambassador Jocelyn Clark Fletcher. Let me just say a little bit about these um, giant women, who they are in life, what they're doing in life, so that as you listen to them, you can picture yourself and see their background and begin to understand you know, what we're talking about with them. I will start off with our distinguished Senator, Jennifer McClellan from uh, uh, District, uh, Virginia District 9. As a daughter of uh, community leaders and educators, our Senator was raised in the segregated South during the, the depression. Jennifer McClellan was raised with a strong uh, sense of servant leadership and a calling to strengthen her community. Her family's experience and her study of history taught her that government can neither be a force for progressive change to solve problems or a force of oppression that benefits a select few. At a young age, Jennifer dedicated herself to ensuring govern government was that force of change for all. For most of her life, Jennifer has channeled those values into her com uh, commitment for progress, equity and justice in the Commonwealth of Virginia. She has implemented those values as a leader in the community, the Democratic Party, and in her own 14 years of service as a legislator in the Virginia Central Assembly. She gets things done. She has been a driving force for progressive change in Virginia, leading the passage of landmark laws to invest in education, grow small businesses, expand access to uh, healthcare, has, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, has been discriminated, I'm sorry, access to healthcare, ban discrimination and inequity, safeguard workers' rights and voting rights, reform the criminal justice system, protect a woman's right to choose and tackle climate change. Jennifer lives in Richmond, Virginia with her husband, David Mills, and their two beautiful children. The next uh, panelist is Ambassador, Her Excellency Ambassador Jocelyn Clark Fletcher. Dr. Jocelyn Clark Fletcher returned home to St. Lucia two years ago to work with the government of St. Lucia as the ambassadors responsible for diaspora affair. Dr. Jocelyn Clark is enhancing efforts of the government to forge links with nat nationals overseas as well as create more dialogue between the two. The role of the ambassador is to communicate with non-resident St. Lucians in different countries worldwide and to assist them in returning home. The next candidate that I will proudly uh, introduce to you is uh, 
Dr. Rugi uh, Balde. She has over 15 years of blended experience in clinical and public health program development with focus on SRHR in capital letters, MNCH in capital letters, HIV AIDS, health systems, strengthening community development gen and gender equality. She has an extensive experience in project management, capacity building, strategic planning, policy formulation, which she acquired in various geographical areas, including the United States, Canada, and the Caribbean sub-Saharan countries. Her passion is to harness her energy and mobilize resources to empower communities to reach their full potential. She is the founder and CEO of a Global Integrated Development Consulting Experts and advisory consulting firm working in, uh, towards improving the health and well being of marginalized and hard to reach communities. My next panelist is a Reverend Adoa Mars. Uh, Reverend is the president and chief C CEO, is the president of Women's of Praise, P R A I Z E, not with an S but with a Z. Women of Praise provides spiritual support for women of color in politics. Most recently, Adoa served as Director of Finance and Development at the Faith and Politics Institute, an organization that advances her democracy by bridging political, racial, and religious divides. Adoa served as President and CEO of Faith Link INC, where she led efforts to provide policy, education, and advocacy training to faith communities. Prior to that, she, she prior to that, she, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> Prior to that, she served as manager of federal affairs at the New England Council, where she advocated for the interests of over 350 businessmen across the region. Last but not least, I'm proud to present Ms. Denise O'Brien. Ms. O'Brien is an award-winning global publicist and humanitarian visionary, strategist, author, communication strategist, speaker, social entrepreneur, global development leader, producer, Whoa, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Ms. O'Brien is a published author, social entrepreneur, professional global speaker, award-winning public relations executive and internationally honored humanitarian. She has, I'm sorry, she is a top uh, C-suite level business management professional. Denise is the dynamic CEO and founder of many innovative companies in the US, including DOME in capital letters, Consulting LLC. She has many other companies that she has at Denise O'Brien International, DOM Entertainment, at California Safari, at Don't, Don't Wait Movement, at Global Gurus, and Wings of Love International. Denise is on a mission to bring others on her journey to make the world a healthier and better place to live despite every current global challenge. Denise has earned numerous social entrepreneur awards. And in December, 2019, she was appointed to the honorary position of World Peace Advocate by the World Peace and Diplomacy Organization. I believe one of our panelists uh, is not here. I think that is Ms. Jocelyn Clark, but if she is, my apology. When we started, I was told she may not be on the panel. So over to you, uh, Mr. MC. Thank you so much for this time, and I'm looking forward to um, this. The, these dynamic women bringing some some of these words to life that we've been waiting to listen to today. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Robertson. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I know we're the second panel, but we are going to keep the energy high as we celebrate the awesome, wonderful women throughout the African diaspora that are leading in so many different ways. Again, my name is Ajawa Ray, and I am so excited and proud to be co-moderating uh, this event and moderating this, e this panel with such distinguished guests. So for all of those who are joining us now for the first time, I'm going to give a brief introduction. I will echo the words of Ambassador Aruna and providing context to this panel. On March 1st, 2020, everything changed as we all know. Life as we know it was upended. And over the past 12 months, we faced unexpected and unrelenting challenges. And through it all, stories of heartache, 
Harold and her er, and hope, excuse me, emerged. In the words of Dr. Kaneem, the executive director of UNFPA, throughout the COVID-19 crisis, women have kept entire societies going, sustaining health systems as the majority of frontline workers and courageously managing extra responsibilities at home and caring for the ill as well as children out of school. They have kept open shelters for survivors of violence against women, and they have scaled mountains literally to distribute help. In short, women themselves have offered vivid, unforgettable testaments to the value of their leadership. And we are here to honor and celebrate uh, some of those women's today. So with that, I'd like to ask all the panelists this first question, and I'll start with Senator McQuellen. As a woman leader at the forefront and in the limelight, how did you manage this past year? Well, thank you uh, first for uh, having me, Edwa, and um, everyone for hosting this event. Um, I watched the last panel and I think I, I nodded vigorously when someone made the comment that um, sometimes, or alluded to, sometimes we don't take care of ourselves or we do take care of ourselves by taking care of others. Yes. Um, one year ago, um, we were just finishing the most consequential General Assembly session of my career. Uh, for the first time I was in the majority party and we made transformative change. I, I carried 49 bills, 36 of which became law. And there were major bills that made Virginia the first state in the South to do many incredible things um, like expanding domestic rights to workers, making Virginia the first state with 100% renewable energy standard, all sorts of amazing things. We adjourned on March 12th and five minutes later, the governor declared a state of emergency. Hmm. And the next day, a year ago today, uh, my children's school shut down and my phone rang off the hook with constituents who were frightened, who were scared, who were losing their jobs, who couldn't figure out how to navigate unemployment, who couldn't figure out how to stay safe, who couldn't figure out what to do with their children because uh, they didn't have childcare. Um, and for, I immediately went into crisis mode because that's how when I see pain, I try to ease it. When I see problems, I try to solve them. And just when we started to come up for air, um, George Floyd was murdered. And I live right around the corner from the largest statue of Robert E. Lee in Virginia. And it became a flashpoint for protests. And so one of the panelists on the last panel talked about what it was like uh, for her in DC, um, hearing police planes over my house every night, hearing noises that I couldn't tell, were they fireworks or were they bullets? Were they tear gas? Because tear gas was going off. Um, and then in the middle of all of that, we suddenly lost my dog. <laughs> so it was sort of one of those moments where it was a lot and, and I, finally reached a moment where I had to turn everything off and just sit with what I was feeling. And what I was feeling was anger and sorrow and pain and yet hope. Because while I realized that I was fighting the same fights that my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents fought, and, and just to clarify from the introduction, it was my parents who grew up during the depression in the, in the segregated South. Um, I looked at my children, my, my five-year-old daughter and my 10-year-old son, and I looked at the young people out protesting and said, enough is enough. I can't leave these fights to my children or these children out protesting. And I took care of myself by after pausing and just sitting with what I felt and, and just feeling that. I then moved forward and said, it's time to put that pain and anger and frustration back to work, helping people. Thank you so much for sharing that, Senator McQuellen. That was very powerful. And I'd like to ask the same question to 
Ambassador Clark Fletcher, if you would also share how you've been able to manage this past year, we'd appreciate that. I want to thank all of you for having me here and to, to thank this, this esteemed panel of organizers and the judge and the panel of um, medical panelists. It is an honor to be representing CARICOM and OECS here because we are small islands and we are not in the United States like all of you are, but we do share so I share that with you, my sisters, while I represent my character and ACS sisters. Okay. Here. Ambassador, I, Ambassador, if you can uh, speak up, we're having trouble hearing. You, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. So maybe my hand was on it. So I hope you heard me. I said that I am, I am here and happy to be here with my, um, which, we, which we share one thing in common, our common ancestry. And so I'm very happy to be here with you representing my OECS and CARICOM sisters, and more importantly, my St. Lucian sisters. We are a resilient people, and this is one of the themes that we've used for our independence this year. COVID-19 has devastated these little islands in ways that you wouldn't understand coming from the big countries as much as I listened to all of you. And I heard the, that you speak of the pain and the anguish that was caused for us. I see the economic um, crisis. I see the mental um, effects on people. I see the, uh, the, 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 the lack of, 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 of finance and, and loss of jobs and not being able to go out. And I see some powerful women mm. rise up during that. For myself, my job is that of being the ambassador responsible for the diaspora. That means that our people, the St. Lucians are there in the diaspora, first, second, and third generation. <laughs> I grieved, and I never had a moment up to now of real rest because of the pain, especially my diaspora in the American, um, the St. Lucians in the American diaspora, who, where we had, we suffered the greatest loss out of, um, as a result of COVID-19. But in this, um, because our country, our leadership, led by a fantastic man who has empowered our women, you would find that the chief medical officer, Dr. Belma George, and, 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 and the minister of education, Senator Mary Isaac, the chief education officer, Mrs. Mayor, the permanent secretary in the um, Ministry of Education, um, Michelle, um, Ms. Michelle um, Charles, the Minister of Education, Dr. Gail Rigobert, the Minister of External Affairs, the, um, the Honorable Sarah Flood Barbara, the, the peer, permanent secretary in the Ministry of, of Finance, um, Ms. Uh, Esther Rigobert, um, the, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, Ms. Donalyn Vitti, and these women are the leadership in the core areas that were mostly affected by COVID-19 in our country. And those women are the ones who advised, who directed, and who have led our country. At one point in time, from March till October, we had no deaths and only 27 um, cases. And after that, a nightmare began, something that just threw us. me so fear and widespread uncertainty. And those women have stood up resilient, not breaking down to the fear and the panic and the disasters that were going on with people not having jobs and the government, went, oh, where, where, what's happening with finance and the economy, what's happening with tourism, which is the mainstay of our economy, what's happening with the, how are we going to do with our students and whether we go back, put them home, close the borders, open the borders? How do we manage our people? Curfew on, curfew off. It, was, it has been a roller coaster ride. But today, I can see with the rollout of the, of the um, vaccine, I see an end. I can see an end. I have hope. And for me, watching those women standing and supporting them, being there for my women, in the diaspora and advising 
my my government on the policies that we put forth to help our people is the way I have handled and dealt with this. That's beautiful. That is beautiful, Ambassador Fletcher Clark. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we're going to come back to you because we want to know more about what you did to, to help uh, mitigate some of the um, effects of the, the pandemic. So we'll be back to you uh, for more on that. Thank you so very much. And I'd like to ask Denise O'Brien, if you could answer that same question. How, how have you leader, woman, sister leader, how have you been able to manage during this difficult time? Well, I, being a publicist, um, I'm trying to record so we can have a record of this momentous occasion. Amazing to be invited. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, the ambassadors, the excellencies, and of course the conveners and moderators of this event. I have to say that I went into complete shock because I was speaking at the Women Economic Forum in Egypt in the first week of March, a year ago this week at the International Women's Forum there and having an opportunity to be with 1200 women around the world who were completely oblivious to what was going on. Uh, I got on a plane and flew through London um, back to LAX International Airport on March 11th. And as we all know, the, the world shut down. I got into my car and I was driving from Los Angeles back to my home in Silicon Valley. During the six hour drive, the entire world shut down. And I had planned on quarantining because I was out of the country uh, because my father's in a home with Alzheimer's and high risk family members. I already had been aware of what was going on, but it wasn't until I got home to my small community where I completely just had to cocoon and kind of really take care of myself. So to boldly state the question that everybody's asking about how are you doing? It was, it was, it was a, such a shock, I didn't quite know what to do because my family, my three children were in LA with their father. I'm a single mom. I was in Northern California to serve and take care of my parents and to be lo then locked down for as many months as we all were. Some of you know um, how bad it was in California and the strict government requirements that we had here. I literally feel like I'm coming out of a cocoon this week um, in terms of my own personal uh, story and what I've been doing to um, caretake my family, which is, you know, my faith first, my family second, and my career third. Um, in regards to the, the question of what did I do during the last 12 months, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but instead of uh, working on uh, the, the things I was doing right prior, producing a large party in Hollywood, an Oscar party for the American Chinese CEO Society, and a few other things, and all the many clients, it was just completely dead. So what I chose to do with my little cell phone, my little laptop, and my little camera is to start highlighting nonprofit organizations around the world, putting them together uh, with virtual summits, giving people stages and platforms like I normally do globally, producing around the world events. And I started to learn how to do uh, what we're doing today. I became an expert at Zoom. I became an expert at many other ways of communication and being my visionary strategist and communication strategist and producer title, I, I had to start uh, thinking about what's looking forward. Of course, we didn't know at the time it was going to take a year, but it soon became obvious that we everything was shutting down. So what I, what I, completely pivoted to do was to start working with my global contacts in Africa, um, specifically in South Africa, in, in Kenya, um, working with the team in India, many executives and uh, people that own big, large companies in India. And in China, I have a lot of contacts there to start bringing PPE to America and taking wherever there were 3M factories that were making masks, that were making PPE gloves. I'm an expert on nitrile gloves and, and syringes and needles and how much it costs to make them and how much it costs to ship them and how fast can we get them around the world. So I immediately pivoted into daily Zoom calls mm -hmm. and connector calls with anybody that was making PPE Mm -hmm. anyone that was supplying PPE and, and starting to build those connections together. So that's what I did at the very beginning and have worked towards. Um, I'd also like to share when I have time, maybe later, uh, being a visionary, what are we doing for the future? You know, we're all yeah. talking about what we'll we got. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. 
you you beat me to it. I have that on on one of my questions for you. So oh. we will get to that for sure. Thank you so much. A lot of times as women, we go into crisis mode and we just do what we have to do to make things happen. And that was a great example of that. Thank you. We are going to go to Dr. Baldi and ask her the same question. And then I just got a message from the producer that we're going to just break for a minute, one minute and 30 seconds. That is it. And then we'll continue our discussion so we can uh, end in a timely manner. We're a bit behind, um, but we're going to make as much of a as much ground as we can on being timely. So with that, Dr. Baldi, if you could answer that question, and the question is, as a woman leader at the forefront, what have you been doing to manage during this pandemic? I think we have you on mute, Dr. Baldi. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel and thank you so much to the organizers and distinguished invitees. Uh, yeah, it is a pleasure for me to share this uh, platform with these wonderful women, leaders, uh, women across the globe. And uh, to start, I would like to share my own, before I start to share my own thoughts, I wanted us to observe one minute in the memory of lives that we have lost throughout this uh, pandemic. Hello? Yes, we are here. We hear you. Okay. Yes, then I think we're fine. So again, uh, this year has been a very difficult and challenging years for all of us, including us as women leaders working in the global health, meaning that uh, we have to be on the ground, on the field, and uh, to serve our communities and make sure uh, fundings that are that have been allowed or allocated are being spent on um, the right way and uh, efficiently. That being said, I had to re reorganize my life. I normally live in Canada, in Toronto, but because of the travel restriction, I had to move in West Africa, in Guinea, where I am speaking from right now, so that I can be closer to project and also to be uh, closer to the communities that we work with. Because usually we all, I mean, our countries, relay more on the international expertise. And that being said, many of us who live abroad and come time to time to provide technical support were not able to come over and uh, provide these services. And given the fact that people are dying and uh, there is so much stress going on across the healthcare system and especially across the frontline workers. Because when you look at the statistics, 70% of workers in the healthcare are women. However, only 25% of them are, uh, are holding uh, leadership positions. And that being said, it is difficult for us to understand as why. And, uh, I have been an activist for gender equality now for many years. And I think COVID-19 has just revealed our, the fact that gender equality is a, a real, it has a real effect on how resources are allocated and how women are really exposed as uh, frontline workers and also the workload who, which has grown over time because of the, when the school went uh, closed, we know all women have a, a huge place to play in the education of their children and in and, and all uh, the chores at home. So this has been a really challenging for women and especially uh, women in the healthcare because as someone said, we are, we are in the burning building. 
And, uh, but so far uh, it has been now, there is hopes and reliefs because we are now working through towards having uh, the vaccine available, made available to us and hopefully it will be shared equitably that each and everyone will have access to it. We are still working on that with pla on, on some platforms to advocate and make sure like, people have access and especially in developing countries, we have access to those vaccines. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Dr. Baldi, thank you. And uh, we're gonna take a one minute, 30 second break. When we come back, we have one more question specifically for their, their tailor made for each of you um, panelists. So we're excited to hear what you have to uh, share with us in response to those questions. And then we will um, start to close the event. Aisha. Okay, so we are we are picking it back up and I have a question for you, Senator McKellen. If you can uh, share uh, some of your experiences in response to this. So as we all know, minorities, people of color have been negatively, strongly negatively impacted by COVID-19. As an elected official, as a political leader, what programs have you initiated or supported to address these challenges, their challenges in particular? Well, thank you for, for that question. I think you know, early on, uh, we focused on making sure that all of our communities, but particularly communities of color, low-income communities, language communities, were getting information uh, in forms they understood um, and, and that we were collecting data so that we really had a clear picture of who was being impacted. Um, we went into a special legislative session where we did everything from um, allocating uh, federal money for childcare, for uh, new unemployment, um, expanding our unemployment compensation, um, putting an eviction moratorium in place, putting uh, eviction and foreclosure relief in place, uh, helping people, um, putting a moratorium in place for people having their utility bills cut off, um, so just to immediately address just the crisis of how do I make it um, and then making sure that as we had testing and vaccines that they were getting rolled out uh, in the communities that had the most people uh, directly impacted, whether it was the frontline workers who are majority uh, women and women of color um, and, and just there were problems before COVID that we were trying to address that now have been made worse. So expanding access to broadband, you know, you name the issue, we had an equity already that COVID has been making worse. So um, we in our special session started dealing with that while frankly dealing with the problems of police reform and police brutality and criminal justice reform. So uh, we just finished this year's session where we adopted a number of measures, again, everything from foreclosure relief to um, making sure that 
people have direct aid. Uh, now we are focused on building recovery and are very grateful working very closely with, with the federal government, with the new Biden administration uh, to make sure that that help gets directly to our people. Um, but we've got a lot of work to do and we know we have, got, once COVID ends, the recovery has to get us back, not back where we were a year ago, because that wasn't good enough for many of our communities that were already disproportionately impacted by just about everything. Is we need to break down that systemic inequity and recognize how COVID has made it worse. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Senator, for sharing that. And just to follow up to that, uh, you know, we'll never forget as we, we showed earlier, we'll never forget where we were when, when the pandemic really hit. Um, there are very few uh, experiences in, in our history that have that, that great impact. But I would like you to share with the, the group here, how has your past leadership experiences prepared you for this critical moment in our world's history? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, so I started, my elected service in a minority party. When I was first elected, I was a young black single woman from the most democratic district in the state in a, a body that was mostly over 50 white men who were Republican. And so I had to learn how to listen, to find out why people believed what they believe, what their life experiences caused them to believe, and then find where we had common ground and move from there. And that taught me, you know, I'm, I'm the daughter of a pastor and a counselor and an educator. And so I already had this innate empathy. And so being able to, in a crisis, stay calm and listen and listen empathetically to identify what people need. Um, and, and if I need them to move in a direction meeting them where they are to get them to move, um, whether it's adopting a policy or just get it, like getting them to go get tested for COVID and wear a mask. Um, and, and realizing that you have to be the, the calm in the eye of the storm if you are going to help people. Um, and finally, I think being a mother, finding those little moments of joy um, and I remember, you know, two very quickly, we decided in the midst, you know, my children were very sad that they missed, they missed their school friends. My daughter missed, you know, we had to cancel our birthday party. We just had a glow stick party and turned out the lights and recorded my daughter making up a glow stick song that we still to this day will play. And then she thinks she's going to be a YouTube star. So she grabbed my phone and recorded a video about how COVID had affected her. Mm -hmm. And at the end, she just said, get some joy in there. And, and I just, I constantly remind myself that as horrible as everything is, you've got to find those moments of joy to keep going. That was truly powerful. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your strong work on behalf of Virginians. I am a Virginian. Uh, and, and I just wanted to thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. So our next question, we're gonna go back to Dr. Baldi, if you are still here. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay, hello, hello. We wanted to kick the ball back to you here. And okay. as, <laughs> as a public health expert and VP of Women in Global Health, Francophone Africa, Please mm -hmm. share with us the challenges you were facing and you, and you mentioned some of them earlier today, but we'd love for you to expand on that. What, if you could share with us some of the challenges you are facing in Africa regarding mobilizing resources for underserved communities. Thank you very much for this question. As I said earlier that uh, we do have issues with mobilizing resources in terms of uh, providing quality services during COVID-19 for many reasons. Usually developing countries rely mostly on the international development donors. At this time, each country is already dealing with their own issues because they have first to, fa to face uh, the, co the COVID-19 within their countries 
before then coming and helping our countries. That being said, we did have to go and think out of the boxes. For instance, for Guinea, what we did, I supported like uh, uh, grassroots organizations and uh, community organizations and NGO, local NGOs that they are able to, to make them able, for example, to go uh, mobilize uh, resources locally and also look for untraditional uh, ways in, uh, in which they can fund some of their activities. For example, the private sector. For example, like uh, even some citizens living in the diaspora, because as you know, in our countries also, beside the, the help that we, the funding that we get from our, I mean, our donors, we do have our, uh, some of our diaspora who are very goodwill and they are sometimes very generous and they mobilize resources in order for them to provide support to people that are living in. So I was able in, in, within uh, the work, the framework that I uh, am working to be able to, to harness that energy so that we can mobilize these resources and uh, address uh, some issues. For instance, we have, we quickly, we were able for, uh, to, to form a group of physicians living abroad, some in, uh, in the US, some in uh, France, uh, in Europe and everywhere, all Guineans, and we were able to mobilize, uh, I mean, some funding to, so that we are able to support our colleagues working here already in the system. That was, so this, just, uh, this, this is just an example on how we, we have been uh, working with our communities. So those are the untraditional ways in which we were able really to, to provide support. Now coming to Women in Global Health, this is a global movement and the headquarters is in uh, Washington DC. And we are the core working group for the West Africa and Francophone community. But globally, there were what we call the COVID 50-50. In that one, we were able to harness energies and then we even had a partnership with WHO so that we can make sure there is the gender equality within the healthcare system, I mean the health workers, and women can speak for themselves and they can hold leadership positions in order for them to make sure they, are, they can move forward. Because when we move with women, it's the entire world uh, which is moving uh, as well. And that is first. And also what I have learned from this COVID-19 is the, to make sure and we are building a resilient healthcare system, but also we have to make sure we have a strong uh, partnership within our countries to make us resilient and so that we can address uh, other issues. And the call that I have to do here is really to call and make sure each and everyone can advocate on behalf of the frontline workers, which are mainly made by women, so that they can have access to protective uh, services, by, I mean the PPI, but also they can have access to the vaccine wherever they are. And you, as me, we all know that we need this because more black women are in within these boats. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Baldi. You said, when we move with women, the entire world moves as well. Yes. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you for the great leadership that you are doing uh, there and, and elsewhere. And uh, we are very appreciative of you. Thank you. So next, we're gonna turn to uh, Denise O'Brien and then we'll, we'll end with uh, Ambassador Fletcher Clark. Uh, but Denise, if we could ask you, from your standpoint, how effective is the communication awareness campaign around COVID-19? And as a follow-up to that, I'll ask this, this now, what role are you playing specifically in communicating, getting the information out, responding um, in your profession to the pandemic? Thank you very much for that question about communication. I have to say, that I grew up in a home without a TV. I did not have a TV when COVID hit. I literally had to figure out how to borrow a TV from a family member so I could start really 
taking in what was going on besides everything on my phone and my laptop. And what I realized after a few depressing weeks of watching, um, let's just say the people in charge of the government and the people in charge of um, governors of states speaking every day about all the deaths and all the terrible things that were going on, I, I literally went into like a depression for a few days and I realized I have to turn off the TV and I have to find a different way and I have to find a different way of working instead of working with the PR and the marketing and the communication and the branding. As I said earlier, I picked up the phone and started talking to global partners. So I feel like I became kind of the uh, Robin, the female Robin Hood to start working. Unlike most of our speakers in the governmental sector, I work in the private sector, B2B. So what I started to do was to reach out to doctors and professors and um, educators um, in my community here in Silicon Valley at Stanford University, UC Berkeley, where my daughter graduated, uh, Loyola Marymount, where I went to school, and to start coming up with educational systems and ideas. And so what I'm looking at now is I'm working with as a kind of a coach, if you will, to these uh, executives that are figuring it out, going from now moving from vaccine distribution, which I know we're all in the middle of that, but as a visionary, I'm already talking to all the doctors and the companies that are setting up the mobile testing units so that we can go back to our lives. And all of us live in different cities around the country. I'm here in California, one of the most difficult places and uh, you know, Hollywood and all the football teams and the basketball teams around the world. I'm working with the African basketball team right now in South Africa, trying to help them get testing and, and PPE that the opportunity for us for the future, I do believe is education. So communication um, is negative in the fact that, you know, we're all trying to tune into the TV and the, the knowledge. But what I'm working with is people um, like the founder of Rainbow Surfers, which is an organization with 80,000 followers, educating and teaching children and equipping them to have self-love and to, um, Think about how can they, you know, all of us, and we're all talking here as women, International Women's Day, I'm a mother, most of you shared that you're mothers, is that we want to help our family first. If we can't help our family, we, we don't want to spend time helping the world. So I had to start with my own family and then start with clients I know that have a really powerful brand and message. And the communication is bringing that confidence and that self-love and sense of control that I think we all didn't have for the last year. So that's what I'm working on. And I, I invite all of you on the panel and all of you listening and all the distinguished guests uh, with us to this journey of the future of educating and testing, which is coming next. Um, feel free to use me as a resource so that you can get the testing right to your countries, right to your communities, uh, into your NGOs, your nonprofits and any business sector. I'm working with the um, venture capitalists that are funding this and the medical professionals that have approved it and the FDA and the early youth authorization. So we're already at that next level of getting our lives back. And most importantly, I just wanna finish off is within the classroom. Here in California, my own daughter is a senior in high school. She just went back to school on Monday, but she's still doing what we're doing, looking at a computer. So we wanna get everybody tested and everybody um, for a, a good price because I know that how expensive that is. So I'm working with various companies that are financing that funding it, distributing it. And I look forward to all of us having a very safe and a very healthy 2021. It's just around the corner. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that, Denise. And last but certainly not least, our last question is for Ambassador Fletcher Clark. Yes. Okay, hello, hello. So I told you that we would get back to you <laughs> and we are certainly happy uh, to hear more from you. If you can please share with us a bit more about how St. Lucia manages the COVID-19 crisis. You know, you mentioned the dynamic women that are at the forefront really leading the effort there. And uh, we'd like to know more about uh, what you're doing there, uh, what you, in particular are doing as well. What is your involvement in the crisis management in St. Lucia? Okay, firstly, my involvement is as the ambassador for the diaspora, I get in touch with my people in the diaspora. And, and if you're here, you would notice that the lines at the Western Union have tripled, I can't even say quadrupled, because the 
we have been encouraging our people in the diaspora to assist their um, people at home, even if those in the diaspora, as I know, have been going through their own serious challenges. Yet, because of the engagements between our office and our people in the diaspora, they have been sending things like PPEs and, and, and a whole lot of medical supplies and supplies for the elderly and, and for little children. And this has become so much and, and it continues. I mean, this week coming, I have so many more to go and collect and help with a, a, an organization that we signed an MOU with so that we can distribute to those homes and to those people. So the diaspora have listened to the call and they all are mobilizing themselves together, not only as groups and associations, but even as individuals. And they would send the medical supplies and food and clothing and, and as well as cash cash to our offices, even if they send to their relatives in the Western Union. But while this is my work, I really don't like um, big it up myself because I'm so, so proud of my sisters who are in leadership as myself, but what they are doing, they are in the forefront. And as I mentioned before, the government has set up something called the command center. Okay, it's headed, yes, by the Minister of Tourism. But who you see in the forefront is the permanent secretary, Donna Lynn Vitae, Ms. Donna Lynn Vitae. Whom do you see coming and help and encourage our people to, you know, to, to hold on, wear your mask, take your, uh, you know, social distance, do not mix with the, 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 um, the tourists. The tourists that we have, they stay in the hotels where they are. They are, they are tested when they get in, in, into the island from the airport, taken in secure vehicles and taken to their hotels and they stay in the property for the duration of their um, holiday stay and they don't interact with the locals. And the city has been um, in, in informing the, 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 the populace step by step as to what we are doing and as things change and as they evolve. The chief medical officer, Dr. Shel um, Sharon Melmar George, I think she's made of iron. I call her my special iron lady. And she's a younger woman than myself. And this woman, a young mother, is so powerful that whatever she puts out in place and she tells the, the administration, they have to listen because when it comes to our, our, the health of our people, the administration would listen to her and what she had to say. Our, medic, our um, Minister of Education is uh, Dr. Gail Regobert. Again, you think it's easy. It cannot be easy on a minister with students have to be home. Where are you going to have, how are you going to put the teachers? How are you going to expand education? What are you going to do? So they went into this virtual platform of teaching our children. And one moment it was up and the next moment it was down again because you open and you close. So it has been so difficult, but this, these women, she and her two female leaders, the permanent secretary, Ms. Charles, and the Mrs. Mayor, the, the chief education officer, they are out there on all, I don't think they, they, they rest, they go late, they back, they're always on the television, in the media, talking about what's happening to reassure parents about their children and, and what not to worry. I mean, it's also tertiary and so on. The Minister of, of, of External Affairs is a female, or the Honorable Sarah Flood Barbara. This lady had to deal with all the external issues that related with the nationals that we had um, trapped overseas. And to advise the government, find the monies to bring them home, speak to the different councillors, speak to the various governments. It was something else out of this world, but she kept the nation informed of what was going on, how they were handling it. And I know they never, ever got a break. We talk about the, 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 the um, permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance. Now, you know, there's no, the economy is a tourism economy and with no money coming, no ships here, which impacts every aspect of our economy. This lady has to be with the administration handling, how do we spread the little bits we have how do we manage? How do we pay our, our government workers, our public officers? It was very, very difficult. Yet, I, we have an administration led by a man who empowers women, who's, who would listen to what the women who have, you know, respect that the women 
know their business, and therefore he gives you the, the empowerment with our Minister of Health. He listens. And with that, we've been able to keep the country stable during this, this period. It has not been easy on the, on the minds and the lives of our young people, on the, the, on the, on, on the mothers and the female, because we are largely a female-headed society. It has not been easy. But there is hope. With the COVID vaccine being rolled out now, we see hope. And I am very, very proud of where we are going. This is a very difficult time. I've never seen anything like that, but we are making strides. And not only this little island, but all the islands in the OECS in the Caribbean. We are different, but we're strong. We are very resilient. And our women are leading me at the front and we are powerful. That is very well said and the perfect way to end this panel. Ambassador Fletcher Clark, thank you so much for sharing with us what you are doing and, and lifting up those awesome and amazing sisters that you have there who are also working alongside you to make such a positive impact in St. Lucia and in the world. We are gonna wrap this panel, but I, I wanted to just throw out some words that I heard throughout our conversation about women. And I heard empathy. I heard uh, consensus builders, strength, courage, resilience, Flexibility, we have shown flexibility. We are problem solvers. These are just some of the words that, that I heard and I pulled out from, from you all that uh, I just wanted to say back to us to just remind us that Dr. what Dr. Baldy said was true. When women move, when we move as women, when we move, the entire world moves as well. So thank you so much to the panelists of the second panel. Thank you to Senator McKellen. Thank you, Dr. Baldy. Thank you, Denise O'Brien. And thank you, Ambassador Fletcher Clark for taking the time to share with us. We honor you. We honor you. We thank you for all the great work, all the leadership that you are, are giving the world during this, this critical time. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to our host, Madam Lenord. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Ado Array for your energy and this excellent discussion. We thank our distinguished panelists and visionaries really for such an empowering exchange. So many lessons to be learned from their leadership and various experiences. You know, COVID is another moment uh, for their dedication and unique contributions to be on display. And we thank them all for being such so amazing, such amazing women. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, we've come toward the end of the program. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lenord, Ms. Lenord, can I disturb you for a minute? Can you please see your notes? Uh, His Excellency Ambassador Frederick has requested if you can give him at least a minute or two to Absolutely. introduce the people that have made this possible in his office with your permission. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, in, well, then I will turn it. Is he ready now? I think so. Uh, Ambassador, are you ready? Okay, so I just saw the note in the in the in the Ambassador Hebe from uh, the Republic of Togo. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, for staying with us. And uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. Go ahead, please. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. You're welcome. My apologies. Allow me to recognize uh, two strong women that support the efforts of the Togolese embassy in Washington, D.C. Please let me honor and say thank you on International Day and Women's Day to Madame Amelia Kwadjo, Economic and Commercial, uh, is uh, the Economic and Commercial Counselor of my embassy. And my daughter, Onela Hegbe, a strong and dedicated social worker in the District of Columbia, who continues working on the short times of the pandemic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ambassador Hebe. Thank you yeah. to, to the women who are behind you. Thank and I must you. say, your daughter looks just like you, really. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. You. <laughs> All right. So as I said, we have come toward the end of the program, and it was my honor to share such a plash platform with all of you. I'd like to invite once again the chair of the African Women for United States Virtual Summit, Aisha Biro Jalo, for the closing remarks. Thank you so much for being with us today, all of you. Wow, 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 wow. What a wonderful, a powerful house of queen leaders. I'm so proud to have you today to host you. Thank you. I will start by that. And, you know, it's like the month of a woman, how to end it, how to be in the middle of the history month of women. And before I can thank our distinguished guests, I want to shout out to our sister, our MVP, who is a daughter of an immigrant who break the glass, glass ceilings in the US, telling all of us we can be anything we want to be. We can we can get when if we work hard, we can achieve our dreams. That's just to say again, happy history women history month to VP, Madam Vice President Kamala Harris. So uh, not let me minute. I would like to thank all the panelists and distinguished guests and the, all the women who work behind this, behind the scene to bring us here today. I would like to thank the women we stand on the shoulder before us, like Rosa Park, Jean Martin Cisse, Willy Mandela, you name it. They work, they work the work for us to be here today to talk about women, to empower women, to bring women to the light of the world. We are, we thank, I th we, we thank you for participating in the panel, this panel this afternoon. This event will not be happen without you participating, accepting to be with us, giving us the time of your weekend that you're gonna spend on Zoom with family. You are the true inspiration and role model for all of us. I also would like to thank my team for the quality of work again and congratulations and thank you for being with us today. And uh, Madam, the host, Leonard, you the best. You did it. You killed it. We get you on the last minute. I want to thank you. I want to thank, like, I cannot stop saying I want to thank you. It's uh a learning process for all of us. We, we are here. I shout to the women around the world, those little girls that sitting home, far away, where they cannot have access to computers to go to school in Africa. One day it will change. Like uh, President Biden said, hope, help are coming. Don't get discouraged. Don't get frustrated. It's happening. We both pass by there before we become here today. And if we can see a VP, woman VP in America, anything is possible. A black woman to be the first woman VP in America. To see those presidents in Af Africa, like Togo, they have a, a woman as a speaker of the house. We have the first woman president in uh, Morovia. We have a lot of women to look up to. We bring life to this world. Like Dr. Balde said, if we work as sisters, as queens, we will change the world. We move the world. Women lead the world. Thank you and have a blessed rest of your day. Thank you, and Aisha. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep in touch. Bye bye. Bye bye. Everybody. bye, -bye. From Little Sunny Lucia. Bye bye. Oh, cool. bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, are you good?